Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to Misinformation in Science and Society. Here to listen, not to judge. I'm your host Annie, and today with us we have Dijon Schäufele, who is a researcher and also a life sciences communications professor. Hi, how are you? Hi, Annie. I'm really, really sorry for being late. Um, I, uh, I was, it's been one of those days, but I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, so let's just get started. Um, could you please like, introduce yourself a little bit and what do you do? Absolutely. Um, I'm Dietram Schoifele. Everybody just calls me by my first name because I can't pronounce my last name. Um, I'm a faculty member here at the University of Wisconsin, uh, and I teach and do research broadly related to how we all make sense of science, of emerging technologies, and how we navigate the world when when those new technologies often change um, what that world looks like, or or maybe what some of the deeper meaning is behind behind of of what we think is true, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So why did you choose this career, like, initially? Say what again? Oh, why did you choose this career initially? I'm not sure if I chose this career or if this career chose me. I, uh, I, I at some point, came over to the U.S. to do a couple of semesters abroad. I grew up in, in Germany, spent uh, all my childhood there, went to school, undergrad there, and then came over to the U.S. and, and, uh, and studied or tried to study um, how we make sense of elections and and why people vote and why they participate in in politics and and then my first job as a professor was at Cornell in, in upstate New York and and uh, at the time we did a lot of research my students and I on on you know what are were some of the political dynamics surrounding for example genetically modified organisms new technologies why do some people want to regulate them others don't so I shifted more and more into or towards science. Mm-hmm. And uh, and of course, COVID and COVID came full circle, meaning, um, you know, we had a scientific issue that split the country basically into two realities or two ways of looking at the world and at the science behind it. So that's the, the really quick um, kind of run through my career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so why do you think that truth is like so important? And why do you think misinformation is such a big issue, like especially right now? I think that that it's really important to distinguish areas where truth matters and then areas where truth is relative, right? So, or where truth is absolute. So science is actually, and I think this is the really important answer to your question, science is our best way of, of, of curating knowledge, of sorting through different types of knowledge and figuring out what is reliable and what is valid knowledge that we can base decisions, policy decisions or personal decisions on. Um, and, you know, climate change should be real, regardless if you're Republican or Democrat, vaccines are safe, regardless if you're Republican or Democrat, and so on. So I think that's where truth really matters. Um, but there's a, a, a second set of questions, and I think this is where things get murkier, and that is what we sh- should we do with that truth? Um, should we, for example, mandate that everybody gets wa- vaccinated? And that's a political question. That's not a question that has a true answer. It simply has an answer that all of us as a society need to come to a conclusion on. Uh, should we drive more slowly on highways? Science says it would save thousands of lives. But it also means that if I'm driving from, I don't know, Chicago to Philadelphia, it's going to take me a lot more than you know just 14 hours because I have to drive more slowly. So the second set of questions, that's where science and truth is important to figure out to inform the answers, but the answers will go well beyond that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I kind of that distinction I think I think is really important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so would you say like um going with like misinformation, would you say there's like a lot of misinformation? Um, like do you think the invention of technology has an impact on misinformation, the spread of it, um, like social media, stuff like that? Yeah, and I I think your questions already slices the problem in the right way. I would slice it the same way. So first question is, is there more misinformation than there was in the past? And and I think the jury is at best out on that, or the answer is probably no, there's not that much more. 
Um, if you look at data from 20 some years ago in elections, two thirds of Americans in, in presidential elections on election day cannot accurately, could not back in 2000, could not accurately place uh, the Republican, the Democrat candidate on an issue as simple as gun control. You can guess what that answer is and you're probably right. Um, and even then, two thirds of Americans can't do that on election day. That's a problem. It has been a problem back then, or it was a problem back then. It's a problem now. So, what has changed? And you kind of implied in your question already what has changed. And I think you're right. Um, now we've created information ecologies or environments where there is a financial incentive to spread misinformation or to at least have arguments and disagreements and people yelling at each other because that ties us to the platform that gets us engaged and the more you like something or you comment on something or you ridicule something on facebook or twitter or TikTok, the more traction it gets algorithmically the more the mathematical algorithms behind the platform pick up on it because that's what ties users to the platform that's of course where the money comes from for them and so that change in terms of how we finance our information has really also changed how how easily misinformation spreads um, and how it's even incentivized by some platforms because that's how they make money. So not more information, but it spreads much more efficiently and quickly um, on those platforms than it used to in traditional media. Yeah. So what do you think people like can do about it then? Like either people as in like just like people consuming the information or like um I don't know, like corporations like how do we try to like avoid or tackle um yep. and and again I think your question already is is really well structured because it gets at both levers that we can apply um the first one you know should all of us do all of us have a bit of learning to do in terms of on that rapidly emerging information environment and the answer is probably yes but at the same time, I think we also need to realize that these platforms and the algorithms behind them are designed to, to deceive us or to, to manipulate us into, into buying things on Amazon or spending more time on TikTok and so on and so forth. So right when, when, when TikTok has, has the health interventions that tells you, well, you've been you know, scrolling for a long time, mm -hmm. the point is that, of course, that, again, increases the... The, the ties to the platform because that's a platform that cares about you so of course you're going to go back to that platform so in many ways the, a lot of the you know to blame individual users and say well you know you need to change um, is a bit unfair because in many ways those platforms are designed to work around and kind of our cognitive or use our cognitive weaknesses our psychological weaknesses our behavioral weaknesses against us so I think the second part of your question is much more promising, and that is we actually do need to think as a society about what those platforms do and how can we find a middle ground where a Mark Zuckerberg or a Jack Dorsey at Facebook or Twitter can still make money and can still build multi-billion corporations. Nobody wants to stop that or prevent that, but at the same time, do it in a way that doesn't harm democracy and that doesn't harm our ability to exchange scientific information. So bringing platforms and politicians and maybe science together into a, into a constructive conversation, I think is really our, our most promising way out of the mess that we've gotten ourselves into. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Um, so what do you think is like the worst type of misinformation if there is one, like about what? I think the worst, yeah, I think I think there are two things that make misinformation bad to just use, use, use that term. Um, one is if it's spread intentionally, right? So, and, 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 and so if somebody creates misinformation just for the sake of, 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 of either trolling or, or damaging somebody's reputation or destroying a political campaign and so on and so forth. So if the intent is really just to be malicious and to destroy democratic processes, I think that's a really, a really undesirable and, and harmful type of misinformation. I think the second and one that that characteristic of misinformation that makes it really harmful is if, if it actually influences behavior. So if if it if it you know makes people engage in violent action, if it makes them not do things that would be good for their community, like vaccination, and if it's designed to do that, meaning to change behaviors and really behaviors that affect all of us, uh, mm -hmm. then I think you know that that's a particularly pernicious type of misinformation, at least from me personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think 
that's all my questions about um misinformation so just for fun do you have like a role model or like people that like inspire you either like professionally or just like in general that's an interesting question i i i think the I, I'm, I'm in my undergraduate class at the end of of the semester. I usually show a quote from Franz Kafka, who was a, an author, a Czech German Jewish author who lived in Prague. Um, and he at some point wrote that you should only read books that pinch and bite you, that that kind of really irritate you, because everything that you agree with, you could you could really write yourself. Um, and I've always found that a, a really kind of a nice way of looking at the world, meaning the more all of us expose ourselves to things that we don't believe in, that maybe even irritates us, that we that that rattles our mental cage, I think the better off we are because two things will happen. Either I, I look at what I've just read and, and I, I'm so upset and I work through it and I decide it still upsets me and it's still wrong. Great. I now have a better view of the world. Or it convinces me that, that my original position was was wrong, even better, because um, then I probably, you know, have come around to something that is just supported by better arguments than what I had before. So I've always liked that that quote a lot. And um, and I don't know if that's what you were asking about, but for me, that's 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 one that I that that really I think is is a good a good lesson for all of us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's really interesting. Um, so to like close this out, do you have any um advice for people, especially like teens? Um, it can be like about anything. I think there are two things that are really exciting for you guys. A, you know, for the last 50 years, a lot of people came out of high school, went through college and took jobs that were very much the same as jobs five years ago, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they became journalists, they became marketing people, they became consultants, they became politicians. I think the world is changing so rapidly that your generation is going into a world that will have whole new jobs that don't even exist yet. And and in college and for universities, and we often talk about this, how do we best prepare students for jobs that don't exist yet? Right? And how do we best prepare you for that? And I think that's a really exciting um, environment. The second thing, my best piece of advice is anything that's related to that you can pick up on related to data and making sense of an increasing amount of data um, if that's statistics, if that's you know any class related to 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 data science, um, I would certainly encourage you to take. Um, that's going to be the currency in almost every field. Um, it's going to you know from history to communication in my field um, to mathematics to genetics. It's all going to come down to analyzing increasing amounts of data and and more and more data coming in. Uh, so the better you prepared you are for that, I think the better prepared you are for college and then ultimately um the world out there because it's it's going to be increasingly that is going to be the currency that that's going to drive everything yeah yeah for sure thank you for those and just thank you so much for being here again um it was really awesome. nice being with you thank you for having me and again i'm so sorry for being late earlier don't worry about it yeah thank you thank you bye